Point of Care Ultrasound has made a real impact on emergency and intensive care, and many of us started off learning some basic echocardiography skills. I want to take the next 6 minutes and 40 seconds to convince you that basic is just the beginning, and that if we take a little time to pay attention, we can really start looking instead of listening. To go beyond basic, we have to do a quick refresher, and one of the core three things we look at is the left side of the heart. We see the right ventricle, the left ventricle, and in this parasternal short axis, we can see this left ventricle really trying to contract but not doing a great job. And this is systolic dysfunction, one of the core three things we assess for. Another one of the core things we look for is right heart dysfunction. And here we see right ventricle left, right atrium left, and in this apical four-chamber view, a big dilated right ventricle, more than the diameter of the left ventricle, indicating right ventricular volume and pressure overload in this patient with an acute pulmonary embolism. And most of us start off looking for pericardial effusion as a first introduction to echocardiography. And as we look here, we see a circumferential anechoic collection around the heart with indentation of the right ventricular free wall, indicating diastolic collapse and echocardiographic evidence of tamponade. But that's really just the beginning of what you can see when you start using echocardiography. This is a 55-year-old man with hypertension, syncope, and chest pain. And in this apical four chamber, here's a linear density in his proximal aortic root. And as we look, we can see this mobile flap indicating the evidence of a type A aortic dissection. This is a 25-year-old man with a history that sounds all the world like viral gastroenteritis, but an exam that shows significant peripheral edema. And in this apical four chamber, we see a large apical left ventricular thrombus, not only indicating this patient has significant systolic dysfunction, but needs to be considered for anticoagulation. This is a woman in her mid-30s from Haiti with fever and flank pain, and her tachycardia prompted an echocardiogram in the ED, which shows a large mobile vegetation on her anterior mitral valve leaflet, and further history revealed prior evidence of rheumatic fever as a child. I find that echo almost always gets you the diagnosis in someone with hypoxemia and breathlessness. And in this elderly male with prostate cancer, visualizing this mobile echo density in his right atrium prolapsing into the right ventricle allowed us to make the diagnosis of pulmonary embolism in a matter of truly seconds. And don't get me wrong, I enjoy waiting around for a CT pulmonary angiogram as much as the next person. But in this patient, taking a look at a high parasternal short allows you to visualize the saddle embolism sitting at the bifurcation of the main pulmonary artery, making your diagnosis maybe just a little bit faster. And you don't need to be an echocardiography expert to see that in this apical four chamber, this patient has significant AV regurgitation, both at the mitral valve and at the tricuspid valve, with strong jets filling the chambers bilaterally with high velocity flow away from the probe. Focusing on the right side of the heart in the same patient, we're able to further characterize this tricuspid regurgitant jet on the right side of the heart. Using continuous wave Doppler, we'll be able to estimate the velocity of this flow, which can give us information about right-sided ventricular systolic pressures. And here we have a static image using continuous wave Doppler along the path of tricuspid regurgitation. And this flow away from the transducer, when measured at its maximum velocity, gives you a pressure gradient of 57.5 millimeters of mercury. When you add that to your central venous pressure, you've just calculated the patient's pulmonary artery systolic pressure. Here's a perfect example of why we need to go beyond the basics if we want to deliver excellent care. This is a 66-year-old guy with hypoxemia, breathlessness, right greater than left pulmonary edema, and hypertension. And if we look at his subcostal forechamber, he has prolapse of the posterior mitral valve leaflet behind the anterior mitral valve leaflet. And if we observe over the cardiac cycle, it's clearly prolapsing into the left atrium during the cardiac cycle. Simply applying color to the same patient, we'll see a jet of mitral regurgitation exiting the left ventricle into the left atrium, aiming towards the right pulmonic veins. And this is why this patient has asymmetric pulmonary edema. He's refluxing blood acutely into the right pulmonic veins, getting right greater than left pulmonary edema. And while we're focusing on the mitral valve, here's a woman in her 50s who presented with atrial fibrillation and slow dyspnea on exertion. And here we see significant mitral stenosis with thickening and tethering of the valve leaflet and this classic elbowing of the anterior mitral valve leaflet in this woman with newly diagnosed mitral stenosis.
Now, this patient has enough atrial enlargement that her apical four is somewhat distorted, but if we watch over the cardiac cycle, the anterior mitral valve leaflet has this elbowing or hockey stick configuration with tethering at the mitral commissure, classic for significant mitral stenosis. And we can't talk about the mitral valve without talking about E-point septal separation, where the early diastolic opening of the anterior mitral valve comes up and approaches the interventricular septum. If this distance is less than 8 to 10 millimeters, the patient almost certainly has normal LV systolic function, and this is a really useful tip for novice sonographers. Contrast that with this patient with significant LV systolic dysfunction. Here's the E point for early diastolic opening of the mitral valve, the A point for atrial systole, and the distance between the E point and the septum, or EPSS, is 18 millimeters, suggesting significant systolic dysfunction. And to close out the mitral valve, here's an M mode tracing demonstrating systolic anterior motion of the anterior mitral valve leaflet with a dynamic LV outflow obstruction in a patient with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And in that same patient, we're able to visualize asymmetric left ventricular hypertrophy with thickening of the septum as compared to the rest of the left ventricular chamber, consistent with LV outflow obstruction and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I can't emphasize enough that echocardiography isn't limited to RV strain, LV systolic dysfunction, and pericardial effusion. Take a look around at the rest of the heart while you're examining it. Pay attention to what you see, and you may just find you're providing rapid, accurate, and more efficient care for your patients in emergency and intensive care settings. Thanks for listening, everybody. Take care.